Well, like I always say, I hope I know what I'm doing. <laughs> Hi there, and welcome once again, everyone, to Cast Iron Wednesday. And, well, I guess you could say every Cast Iron Wednesday is something special, but uh, in a way, I guess today is uh, very special and hopefully a little bit different because, well, as mentioned in the uh, description, tomorrow, as we all know, is April Fool's Day, and, well, why am I so excited about that? I mean, after all, I do. This channel is called Cast Iron Chaos. And believe me, when it comes to chaos, I mean, there's really no, almost no better time of the year to celebrate it than uh, April Fool's Day. <laughs> I've uh, had something of a tradition going on for the past few years in that around uh, this time of year, I make, I go out of my way to try something a little bit different different <laughs> and the results each year have been uh rather have been varying this year yeah it definitely turned out to be uh, something unexpected and that's what i'm hoping to share uh with you tonight so um as i said this is uh cast iron wednesday so i guess i should start off by uh answering the question okay so where's the cast iron well the answer is right here so, uh, yeah, as I mentioned, uh, it did not really turn out to uh, be, uh, yeah, it did not exactly turn out the way I planned, which uh, <laughs> seems to happen uh, quite often, um, in that I had originally, <clears throat> uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about it as I'm uh, cooking it, but uh, anyway, for uh, very strange reasons that even took me off guard, what we are preparing tonight is something you would not expect for April Fool's Day, and that would be Haggis. Well, actually, it is and it isn't haggis because, uh, as you know, haggis is actually banned in the United States. And that's because uh, the ingredients in haggis, one of the ingredients in particular, namely sheep's lung, is uh, actually banned because of, our con you know, because of contamination or possible contamination. So, um, what I have here is something of a an American version of haggis, which I actually, I like the way it turned out. I can only hope that uh, after it's cooked, it'll still turn out okay. So what we really have here is, in fact, uh, gently simmering in this uh, enameled cast iron pot here, we've got our haggis. And, uh, of course, for those, uh, for those folks who know about haggis, they, well, I, I think I probably don't even have to describe what haggis is, you know, that Scottish dish of awful, O-F-F-A-L, things like uh, sheep's lung and liver and heart uh, all boiled up in the stomach. Uh, but as anybody who's uh, had a properly prepared haggis, especially from Scotland, knows, you have to serve haggis with your uh, neeps, which would be turnips here and tatties or taters, which of course are uh, boiled and mashed potatoes, yeah, which really shows how things are prepared uh, there in uh, Scotland and in Europe. Namely, pretty much everything here, you just boil the heck out of it. Well, that's why I'm calling this an American haggis in that we're even now gonna be doing this a little bit different. <laughs> Um, in that, um, well, as, okay, now I guess would be the time really to uh, talk a little bit, bit about the haggis, <laughs> in that I ended up with uh, quite a bit left over because, yes, I actually tried making it myself, and so not only do we have the haggis in skin, unfortunately, it was not uh, sheep's stomach, no, uh, but uh, I ended up with a whole bunch of uh, leftover as well, so... Uh, so give me a second, I guess, to say hi to everyone. Hello, William Hurt, having buttery steamed and fork mashed tater in the pan, uh, that cooked my steak. Oh, that sounds really good. So, but hello, Andrew Bonificio, Michael, um, uh, Militello, Bookworm73, Fluffy Otter1, Pawpaw Dan, hey, CIC, and Jamie. Hello, everybody. I'm running late again, cooking supper right now. Be back ASAP. <laughs> And Jamie says, hey, Papa Dan, if I burn supper, my wife won't let me ever forget it. Oh, yes. And uh, JD High 4, hello from Long Island, New York. Recently read about modern enamel pots like Le Creuset and Stove having bad heavy metals in their enamel that can find its way into food. Thoughts? Yes. 
thoughts. No, there are not bad heavy metals in enamel cast iron that can find their way into food, including le creuset. Um, the modern, the, this seems to be taking traction recently, and really, you can have probably a great deal of it can come down to one source, namely, good old lead free mama, aka uh, Miss uh, Lead. Uh, in that she has uh, spent the last few years, in particular, on her blog um, and her uh, and uh, her uh, and her web page, all accusing enamel uh, cast iron, including Le Creuset, of containing cadmium and other heavy metals that are out to poison us. And I will disagree with that. In fact, I have disagreed with that, and I have posted the reasons for that uh, disagreement uh, on uh, the uh, comment section of uh, other parts of my uh, YouTube channel as well. Um, I believe, oh yeah, if you go to my uh, video, the one where I talk about uh, cast iron from China not being contaminated with lead, those comments show up there, including a link to other sources of information which note how um, Le Creuset especially, but other kinds of enamel cast iron as well. Number one, Le Creuset does not have lead in its enamel. Number two, the interior of its uh, cast iron also, enamel cast iron also does not have things like cadmium and other things. Number three, the outside, well, apparently has very base trace elements of it. But uh, number one, it's on the outside, and you're not going to contact it enough so that it will uh, leach into your skin. And number two, uh, the, uh, in that, the amounts in there are safe. Uh, yes, safe, as in um, if you're a subscriber to the belief that the only safe amount is zero amount, well, unfortunately, there's not much that can be done about that. Because, uh, as I understand it, that's a uh, basic part of the... Uh, uh, part of the process. But um, anyway, it's uh, really complicated. And um, and as I said, I am subscribing to the uh, understanding based on uh, sources of information that enamel cast iron is safe. And by the way, look at this. What do we have here but an enamel cast iron pot. This is the one, in fact, that I had acquired about a year ago. It's an Asian maker and it's not Le Creuset. I acquired it on uh, Valentine's Day. It is my heart-shaped cast iron, uh, enameled cast iron. So, <laughs> um, okay, Jamie wants to comment something real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Well, <laughs> that well, there's something about that as well. She says, if zero lead is the only amount of lead, then don't eat fish. Well, yeah. Well, again, that's complicated as well. And yes, admittedly, I did in fact want to. Yes, but admittedly, I did want to um, start. I did want to uh, talk about uh, conspiracy, foodie conspiracy theories tonight. So, and in fact, this is uh, in a way, this is a kind of on subject. That's one reason why I have an enamel cast iron pot, uh, pot as well as my aluminum uh, cast iron pot, also. So we should doubt Lead Mama's lab results that show some cadmium in the food cooked inside Le Creuset. Uh, I would probably doubt it, yes, for some reasons. Namely, number one is that, um, is that really I've yet to see her results duplicated. I mean, why? I mean, for instance, she's been uh, at this for years. She even started on her own uh, nonprofit foundation about that, and well, that uh, got uh, some drama of its own, which I'm not going to get into either. Uh, but nonetheless, despite all that, uh, are there any sites out there uh, that really use her results as a reference and back them up and further test them and duplicate them? Because that's really whole part of the scientific method. Namely, you uh, produce evidence and then it has to be duplicated as well in by, um, you know, by third party or additional testing. So, and Raymond says it's mercury and fish, not lead. Yeah, that's, that's also true. So. Correct. You are correct. <laughs> okay. Um, so anyway, as far as uh, lead safe mama goes, um, okay. 
I am, as I said, I am skeptical of her results, largely on the on the uh, basis that they are so far they only stem from one source, namely her own. Um, so I'm not absolutely going to completely diss her and say, no, she is absolutely false because I can't do that. And I'm not qualified to do that. On the other hand, um, I am not seeing any other, uh, sources of information other than crunchy granola blogs, uh, with websites that I do are, uh, that I'm even more skeptical about, uh, that, uh, really are, uh, really, uh, backing up her results. So, uh, nonetheless, uh, yeah, it's probably best that we don't know what's in our food or pants. No, that's certainly true. <laughs> so, um, having said that, uh, what, what are of, uh, Mark Curtis, uh, comments, message retracted? Um, good question. Uh, I am looking at it as well on my, on my, uh, live where I have uh, full control and it's saying, and saying the same thing, message retracted. I did not do anything. I did not click anything. So I do not know what is being retracted here. I do have a filter for certain words though. Uh, you know, like naughty words and a few advertising words and a few uh, political words. So it may be that that could be related to that. I mean, YouTube also has its own spam filter, which is fairly accurate, sometimes not, but fairly accurate. Anyway, I've been standing around uh, talking all this time, so let's get down to uh, some cooking. But nonetheless, yeah, it, okay, uh, I should say again, for tonight, as I said, especially because it's April Fool's Day coming up, I did want to be a little foolish and talk about this kind of subject because, yes, this is related to cooking in cast iron for the simple reason that if on any, uh, any Facebook group or other discussion board or any place at all where people love to show off their cooking, these type of comments always come up. On the Cast Iron Cooking Group on Facebook, we have to enforce a no politics rule, especially to keep the uh, group from, uh, you know, from um, getting bogged down in arguments over all of this when we would rather have cooking. So, but tonight I did feel I wanted to uh, actually bring this subject up, especially because it's April Fool's Day and I wanted to do something a little different. And so that's why I am bringing up stuff like, hey, look at this, for instance, canola oil. Not only that, it's processed and it's in a spray. Oh no. And what am I doing? I am spraying it onto my cast iron before I cook with this. Oh gee, isn't that a shame? Well, that's because again, there are people who uh, immediately start up with saying how, <coughs> excuse me, how canola oil is bad for you. And I will again, disagree with that. Having done that, Okay, what I've got here is some of this uh, homemade almost haggis that I, uh, yeah, that's left over from the uh, preparations that I made. Now, uh, in addition to boiling it, which is the standard uh, method for uh, preparing haggis, I wanted to uh, try out and uh, actually fry some of it simply because of the, uh, yeah, simply because of the uh, ingredients that are in this. Also, I'm hoping it kind of increases the flavor, too, um, because, you know, like, again, that's the thing about European cooking and British cooking and Scottish cooking. Pretty much like it or not, really, every uh, as they say, that kind of cuisine usually comes down to boil the heck out of it. Yeah. So um, this way, who knows, you may have a little bit of a, yeah, a little bit of, of, of extra flavor uh, by doing it this way. Um, let me check one more comment and then I'll say a little bit more about this almost haggis. Um, I'm sorry? Fan? Oh, okay. Yeah. Start up the fan. Okay. Good point. All right. Uh, Frank Marullo, I left Port Jefferson in 1990 to move to Montana along with me and I brought my mother's cast iron skillets, 2021. And I still use them and I'm 66 years old and very much congratulations on that. So, <laughs> Uh, William Hurd, I use spray canola oil, use some this very night. I never thought about the ozone I go through cans of spray. Well, yeah. Uh, my understanding is that it's not nearly as bad as it was in the past. And that's one of the things 
I do want to bring up when it comes to some of these, uh, you know, when some of these things that they keep saying are bad for you and that uh, over time, the companies have in fact taken some steps at least to uh, produce uh, you know, materials like this that are somewhat more friendly for the environment. Uh, one of which I think would be uh, these uh, sprays. Another, which I'll uh, also bring up, is uh, yeah, flor yeah, the uh, fluorocarbons. <laughs> another that I think I'll bring up in a few minutes or so is another uh, thing that uh, we hear about all too often: so-called margarine. But if you notice, this thing no longer says margarine because, in fact, it's not really. They actually have uh, taken steps to uh, change that around so that technically it can no longer be classified as margarine. And that's why uh, with a lot of these so-called butter spreads, like country crog, for instance, it not only says spread, then it no longer says margarine. Hmm. But let me backtrack for a moment. As I mentioned, this is kind of like an American haggis. Hey, let me get a close-up of this, in fact. I'm sure you wouldn't mind seeing that. This is something like an American haggis because, as I mentioned already, some of the ingredients in haggis are unfortunately banned in the USA, especially, uh, well, really, especially lamb parts in that I found, no, it is not possible to legally get sheep's lung here in the U.S. Apparently, this has been going on since the 1970s when they did put a ruling in place banning lung tissue in food. Uh, apparently, it has to do something about the possibility of other bodily fluids uh, resulting in uh, contamination. And so, because of that, they took the step of uh, banning it. So now, it is unfortunately impossible to legally get haggis in the U.S. And that's one reason why, okay, why haggis? Why haggis for April Fool's Day? As I mentioned, I had wanted to, I tried to do something a little unusual every year. And uh, like, for instance, last year, if you check the videos on my channel, last year I did this gravy and mixed in grasshoppers, real grasshoppers with it. And I thought it turned out pretty good. The year before that, I did the same thing. And that one I used, no kidding, ox penis. Yes, it's there. It's on my channel and you can find it. And the year before that, I made pot brownies. <laughs> uh, again, check my channel and you will see it for yourself. Well, uh, for all of this, as I was uh, really trying to figure out what would I want to experiment with for my April Fool's uh, uh, video this year, I was browsing through a uh, Hispanic market that I like browsing through. And what did I come across but a package of pork stomachs. Now, in the first place, I wasn't actually familiar with it, and I've learned something about it since then. And the pork stomach I learned, first of all, is actually very, uh, not exactly common, but it's well known, especially in the American South, isn't it always, as hog maws, you know, namely, which again is uh, pretty much the uh, pork stomach. And initially, though, when I saw stomach, I thought, hey, you know what? Maybe I should try using this to make haggis. And I picked it up, and it's still sitting in the fridge, in fact. Only because I did research, and I found out that pork stomach it has a very, very different consistency from the type of stomachs that you see, like, say, lamb stomach. Because here's the thing, and why uh, some people get grossed out about the idea of eating sheep's entrails cooked in a stomach. Now, really, all that they have done with haggis is they have come up with a big Scottish sausage. That's pretty much all it is. It's ground up meat cooked up in the uh, in the uh, sheepskin. Because after all, what really is the difference between cooking in a sheep's stomach versus your regular sausage that is wrapped in pig intestines? So I considered that, and that's why I wanted to uh, give this a try. Now, I, as I said, I did some research, meanwhile, into pork stomachs, and I found out it has a very, very different consistency in that pork stomach is not the same as intestine and not even sheep stomach, which is similar to intestine. Namely, it has to be prepared in a very different manner. Among other things, you stuff it with sausage and vegetables, and then you roast it in the oven. And that actually sounds pretty good, and I am going to have to try that since now I have that. However, especially since I was trying to make the ingredients for haggis, I realized I did not think that that would work with 
haggis. So I, I ended up uh, not using the pork stomach in this. Meanwhile, as I mentioned, I could not get sheep entrails. Uh, you know, I could not get sheep lungs and hearts and kidneys and diaphragm and all that. So I decided to set out and uh, substitute. As a result, yes, there is lamb in this. I found ground lamb, you know, good old ground lamb. And that's what most, that's what about half the meat in, in this is. For the other half, about a quarter of that or half of that, uh, I ended up getting some good old beef liver, some regular liver. And then for the other part, I got chicken hearts. So that even though I could not find lamb liver or sheep hearts or anything like that, I used beef liver and chicken hearts and ground it all up with some suet as well, which of course is congealed beef fat. Ground it all up, mixed it in with the uh, ground up lamb, and lo and behold, this, I guess you could call it an American haggis. It's not quite the same as real traditional haggis. And anybody from Scotland who has heard this is probably going, that's not haggis. Well, that's why I'm calling it American haggis. Because here's the thing about American cuisine. You know, what is American cuisine? Well, pretty much we take other countries, uh, other countries cooking and change it all around completely and then call it our own. <laughs> yes, I'm kind of joking about that. I mean, I'm not obviously have to offend anyone because, you know, there is some truth in that. I mean, what can you say about America where one of the most popular dishes uh, anywhere here in the United States is pizza? Hmm. So um, fried chicken may very well be an American dish, but on the other hand, pizza, as you know, has its roots in Italy, and we've done all kinds of things to it, making Chicago deep dish pizza and broccoli pizza and Hawaiian pizza, all of which I like. But for the same reason, I'm considering that to be um, the way American cooking has changed foods, and so Lo and behold, what I have here is what I call American haggis. And that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. Now it's really just... Yes? Yes? Oh, yeah, no, that's true, yeah. As, as she points out, Chinese fast food are the kind that you get in any takeout pan, any takeout place. That is not Chinese. That is all American. That's all been changed around and made American. And so this is kind of like the same idea. And, you know, I have to say, well, as I was preparing this, this actually ended up smelling pretty good because in addition to this, I did throw in some spices, including things like some allspice and some thyme. Um, and the end result is turned out to be, I think, not so bad at, at all. Oh, yeah, and there's and I also ground up some onion as well because, of course, you have to have onion in with the haggis too. So this is the fried version. The boiled version is here. And one way or another, I'm gonna have to try this and see how it turned out. Well, as, as I said, this doesn't look too bad at all, does it? Okay, I think I've said enough. Let's see what else, what we have. JD Hive, I've heard that brains are no good and banned because there are things potentially in brain tissue. Yes, I have actually seen brains for sale, both uh, fresh and canned. I was tempted to try that, but I was kind of discouraged from it because they say that supposedly there's like a one in one million chance that you could end up with getting mad cow disease from it. So, huh. Uh, Bill LeBlanc, love haggis, material ancestry. Besides, it's not too far from Cajun Ponce or Boudin, indeed. Uh, Garway, I traveled through Scotland two years ago. Your haggis looks identical to the kind I had for breakfast in Edinburgh. The best haggis was formed into patties, fresh and, and topped with chutney. Well, I've already kind of spread this out, so I can't make a patty from it now, unfortunately. And now I regret that. But nonetheless... This is, uh, yeah, that's right. As he says, uh, do not uh, prions, brain, and they can relate to spongiform encephalitis. So, yeah. Uh, so, no, I have not used brains in this. Uh, JD Hive, is it, it is okay to use most any food safe oil to spray onto pans for cooking and seasoning. Indeed. How to cook steak properly in cast iron? Well, the best way to do that 
is uh, is just that you get your pan good and hot and you sear it the real trick about cooking steak and cast iron is temperature control and you can do that either and in several ways and that's why there are like a hundred different methods for cooking steak in cast iron I mean, you know, some say you start by searing it in a pan and cooking it in the oven. Some talk about the reverse sear. Some just simply uh, do it all on the stovetop, which I tend to do myself. When I do it on the stovetop, I do my best to keep track of the temperature with a uh, little probe thermometer so that when it reaches the right temperature, out it comes. On the other hand, that's also why the reverse sear method is so popular. As I said, there are uh, like a hundred different ways for cooking steak and cast iron, and they are probably all correct. So now at this point, oh yeah, I also forgot. I'm, in addition to the meat and the onions and everything, I I uh, ground. Uh, I also use steel cut oats. That's one of the other secret ingredients as well in uh, haggis. You mix a lot of oats in with it. I could have mixed in oatmeal, but I wanted to try to be traditional. So, having done that, I guess there's really not much else I can do, but my first attempt at making what I call American haggis. Let's move this uh, over a little bit more. So that you all get to see it. We'll probably turn this off as well. go and I have actually eaten genuine haggis before several years ago probably more than 10 years ago in fact Ugh. gotta be careful here I'm trying to lift this thing unfortunately still with my wrist I'm sorry to say so I think I'll have to change this around a little bit anyway well, at least 10 years ago as I've mentioned before, when I was with the Church of the Subgenius, their, reg their annual X day end of the world um, drill, someone brought some real haggis to uh, X day and he cooked it there. He might have overcooked it because I think it was, I remember it was kind of dry and I remembered eating it and it had something like the consistency of cat food. Yes, I just said consistency. No, I don't know about the taste. <laughs> But I didn't mind it, other than the fact that it was very dry. This might end up being kind of dry also, but, well, I guess all we can do is find out. Hmm. Hey, this does not smell bad at all. Hey. Don't worry, I'll be quick, I promise. But, of course, you know, with all of these April Fool's dishes, it really doesn't matter as it, it's really... I have to I have to try it myself, you know, in order to show you that I'm being genuine here. So in fact, let's come up to here, if you don't mind. Hmm. And here it is again. American haggis. Haha. <laughs> hmm. Hey, you know what? Hmm. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Mmm. Mm-hmm. I like it. Yes. I'm definitely going to have to put this real recipe on my on my uh, website. So, everybody, really, this was not bad at all. As I mentioned, it's a combination of ground lamb, um, beef liver, chicken hearts, all ground up along with a lot of oats and ground up, um, um, oh yeah, ground oats, ground up onion, and some spices mixed in. This was not bad at all. Mm. Yeah, hey, which means now I'm looking forward to the next step. Mm. Mm-hmm. Definitely. I started this out as, like I said, something of an April Fool's um, gag. But it has turned out into something real, and yeah, I like this. I still say I, I wouldn't mind if uh, Jamie were to try some of this, but I know she's kind of leery about the liver, so. <laughs> That's all right. 
Meanwhile, yeah, <laughs> lamb liver is very strong, beef is milder, and pork is the most mild. Well, yeah, I don't deny that, but mm, this thing's actually got something of a sweet taste to it, probably because of the spices and the oats. So I am not complaining about this at all. I'm going to finish this thing up with no trouble. Um, well, yeah, speaking of trouble, while I was preparing these things, my cats went crazy. They were, they were, you know, climbing up my leg, all trying to get at it because, you know, they smelled the liver and they smelled, uh, the pieces that I was grinding up. So yeah, they, this was definitely appealing to them also. So hmm. funny thing is though, if I try feeding them liver cat food, yeah, they serve, they, they turn their noses up at it. <laughs> um, Thought of you today, chaos in my kitchen. Uh-oh. Spilled a cup of hot grease on the floor. Ouch. My condolences, Papa Dan. Got the floor cleaned up before the wife knew. <laughs> okay, we won't tell her. She thinks I'm a sweetheart for, for cleaning the floor. We definitely won't tell her then. <laughs> okay. Yeah, cat food. I ate dog food out of the trowel when I was four years old. Yeah, once as a joke. My dad gave cat food to my brothers and I and didn't tell us what it was. So we were like about nine years old or so. So anyway, well, if you say that lamb liver is very strong, I'm glad I didn't use lamb liver. I will repeat again, the ingredients in this are ground lamb, you know, your typical ground lamb meat, uh, beef liver, ground up chicken hearts, uh, some steel cut oats, some ground up onion, and uh, a few basic spices, really of the kind you often see in British dishes. I think there's some allspice, there's some nutmeg in there, some thyme, and a couple of other things. That's probably why it has something of a sweet taste. But yeah, I really like how this turned out. Um, oh yeah, as for my skillet, well, as I've told you, that is my vintage uh, BSR Red Mountain Number no. Eight, one of the um, one of my most favorite um, dishes to use in the kitchen here. So on the whole, I'd say we're off to a pretty good start. Now, meanwhile, having done all this, let's move over. Actually, I think I'll keep the view on here and move those other things over. Let's get a little bit closer if we can. I also don't want to jinx about the fact that since I upgraded the RAM on my uh, laptop, this connection, this live connection has been going pretty good. So having said that, I think now it's time to dig out uh, another piece. And that would be... <sighs> Nappies, uh, because as I said, when you do haggis, you've got to have it with nappy. Am I pronouncing it right? Naps and tatties. I think that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. And I said tatties, T-A-T-T-I-E-S, please. <laughs> so uh, you can make all the nice comments you want. So yeah, we've got ourselves some uh, chopped up and boiled up. Well, to be absolutely honest, it's rutabaga. Uh, I wasn't able to find turnips today, but on the other hand, I found that rutabaga makes a decent substitute for turnips, and it's even acceptable in Scotland. So that means now we just drain this. Ah. Uh. Throw in some here of our spread because, as I said, we are talking about this kind of stuff tonight. I think I'll talk about this as I'm mashing this up. And that again. And we can start mashing. As we are now, well, let's see if I can't get a little bit closer yet. There we go. That might that might do. Now, as we're mashing, let's, cut, let's talk a little bit about margarine. Specifically, 
you know, there are a couple of those stupid little um, memes or scary pictures, and there's still more water in this. Hold on one second. Let me redrain this again. Let's do this right, shall we? My bad. Apologies for the delay, folks. I think I'm always saying that. Oh, let me do this. There we go. Hey, that worked. Take two. A little bit more water. There we go. That's better. Anyways, I was saying the next thing we're talking about that we hear about all the time when cooking these days is margarine. Now, again, there are a couple of stupid, scary pictures going around online that you have probably seen on one of your favorite foodie groups or maybe even received it in an email. Um, there is the one that says, don't use margarine. It is one molecule removed from plastic. And the other is margarine was originally invented to fatten turkeys. And so uh, why do they feed it to humans? Now, both of those are outright lies. Remember how I said I was skeptical of um, lead safe mama and I'm not going to accuse her of lying? Well, those two little pictures about margarine, they are outright lies. They are not true. Uh, you look up the history of margarine and you see that yes, in fact, it was meant as an inexpensive substitute for butter. There's no denying that. It was in fact invented by uh, Napoleon's army. Um, Napoleon wanted a, just that, an inexpensive um, substitute for butter that could be uh, taken on the road as his armies went over Europe. And he actually did this cooking contest for people to uh, enter and have them winning a really nice prize. And somebody came up with what he called oleo margarine. And that's where the oleo comes from, from the uh, chemical combination that he used. Uh, initially, in fact, he started by using beef fat, but they've long since uh, taken beef fat out of margarine and they use vegetable oil instead. Now, the couple of things. One is that for it to be considered legally considered margarine, it has to be like about 80% vegetable oil, as well as the, uh, what is it, the polyunsaturated fats and the other things that are uh, considered now, as of about the last couple of decades or so, to apparently contribute to heart disease. And yeah, that was the thing that really became the craze about 20 to 30 years ago when there were some very valid scientific uh, studies that came out, not just fringe ones, not just scare ones, that apparently did show a link between uh, the ingredients in margarine and heart disease. And yeah, that was really a blow to the industry. So much so that the big producers now of most of these uh, margarines, such as, such as Country Crop, you know, which has always been my favorite, they took steps to change their ingredients. And their customers objected. They, they preferred the uh, original ingredients. So, but nonetheless, uh, that's what they did. And now as a result, the, among other things, if you look at the ingredients list, a real ingredients list of things like, say, country crop, for instance, and no, they're not even paying me for this. <laughs> but if you look on the ingredients list, you'll see it does no, it no longer contains uh, a lot of those uh, things that were said to uh, have uh, caused problems. I mean, it does mention things like monodiglycerides um, and the like, but it does not contain, uh, I really should have kept a, a listing of, of the uh, more dangerous stuff, but that it's no longer in there. It's now it's much more just uh, really shield vegetable oil um, more than more than anything else. And in fact, as I mentioned, it has to contain like 80% vegetable oil to be considered margarine. Now it's more like, uh, this one is 28% vegetable oil spread. So yeah, they have seriously reduced the oil content. And it's things like that is why I continue to uh, get and use these spreads because they no longer, I mean, yeah, no, they no longer call it margarine in these kind of spreads. They just call it spreads. 
And that's, as I said, that's one of the reasons why I don't have a problem using it and cooking it and even eating it. So I am not, I am not going to kill myself by eating up this um, rutabaga that I made and mixed in a whole bunch of this spread. In fact, there isn't even a lot here. I might as well use all the rest of it, and then I can throw this container out or recycle it. Sorry, recycle it. <laughs> So anyway, that is some details about spread and why I don't mind using them and why I really do not like those stupid scare stories going around about margarine is going to kill you and it's one molecule removed from plastic. And no, it isn't either. I mean, that's all made up. The part about it being one molecule removed from plastic, number one, so what? especially because it's, well, it's not even just one molecule removed, but even if it was one molecule removed, well, you know what else has one molecule difference? Like, say, the difference between water and um, hydrogen peroxide, for one. I mean, there is only less than one molecule difference, and yet we can drink water and we can't drink hydrogen peroxide, so it's completely, yeah, that's the really a huge difference there. And no, margarine does not contain plastic. It does not contain paint chemicals. It does not contain rocket fuel chemicals, unless you consider things like water and vegetable oil to be part of paint and uh, rocket fuel. <laughs> so that's another conspiracy theory that I am pretty much mocking and laughing at. So having said all that, we've got ourselves some rutabaga. Jamie, did you want some of this uh, rutabaga? In a little bit, she said. Not finding not finding good deals on vintage cast iron here in Oregon. Yeah, I know. Uh, they antique stores charge like two hundred dollars for a Wagner Sydney O. Oh, my condolences on that, Alex. Um, the best I could say is, if you uh, want to look for vintage cast iron at a reasonably affordable price, one place I would suggest would be the Facebook group called. Um, Iron Man Auctions. Let me repeat that. Iron Man Auctions. That is a Facebook group, especially for people to sell vintage cast iron. And they do a great job policing each other in that they're knowledgeable. And uh, because of that, they're not going to... They're not going to do things like sell a uh, Wagner Sydney O for $200. Rather, it will be a much more affordable price. You probably won't be able to get it dirt cheap, but on the other hand, you won't get ripped off either. Tell Papa Dan, tell Jamie that I'm making her brownies tomorrow for, for, the, for, her gran, uh, for my grandsons. That's awesome, That's awesome she said. <laughs> How old is the grandson, she asks. William Hur. Napoleon Cooks also invented the calzone. He said an army marches on its stomach, so they made a pocket pizza that looked like one. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> and that's how things change over time. Uh, tuned in for cast iron and saw Magnolite. That's Big Lou BBQ. <laughs> well, we're not done yet because the cast iron comes next. I've just prepared some, um, as I mentioned, some rutabaga which is essentially I did as a substitute for turnips. And this has turned out nicely. So now that we've done that, let's get out some cast iron, shall we? And make, it, make this guy happy and everybody else too. Uh, so next up. Ugh. Uh, While you tuned in for cast iron, ugh, here is cast iron. And not only cast iron, but the, a Griswold number eight Dutch oven, in fact. Yeah, this again is one of the most used pieces in my kitchen, and it's uh, one I'm really proud of, it's, but not for the least of which, because I managed to score it at Brimfield for only ten dollars yeah it was one of those things is that i found the pot underneath uh, literally underneath a pile of junk and it was all rusted and orange and everything so i spent a fair amount of time really doing my best to clean it up and it worked 
whereas the lid, on the other hand, was acquired separately. In fact, it was a gift. So <laughs> uh, a lot of the items in my kitchen seem to be like that. I'm, I guess I'm lucky in that respect. But I'm not trying to boast about that, but I'm just pointing out that this was a really good bargain. <laughs> and bargains can still be had even these days. But then, nonetheless, here it is again. This is a Griswold Dutch oven with a Griswold lid. In this particular model, they call this the button lid. Button, B-U-T-T-O-N, button lid. And in here, we got ourselves some potatoes because I really love making mashed potatoes in this thing. Mm-hmm. Mm, mm, I, love, I love some potatoes, only I think he liked them French fried. Um, now for this, we are going to throw in, well, since we're out of the spread, let's throw in some real butter, shall we? And then from there, throw in some milk. Uh, yeah, thing about butter, of course, you know, butter is, well, not as, not that healthy for you either, and yet, not, and yet our country is really not giving up on butter. So, I mean, if you're concerned about, uh, having margarine and you might as well be concerned about butter as well in short have it in moderation not to mention some good old pasteurized homogenized milk which i would much prefer over the stuff that they uh over the stuff that costs three or four times as much and may be more dangerous when we're talking about uh so-called raw milk <laughs> because that is dangerous. Um, yes, I know it is possible to safely make products with, with raw milk, but there is still a risk involved. And in addition, a lot of that uh, silly granola nonsense about the benefits of raw milk as things like up to and including a cancer cure, well, <laughs> I'm not even gonna, it's not even worth getting into. I'm really not a big fan of those kind of things because why is it it's like you always have to hear, oh, this stuff is good against cancer. Pretty much there, it seems like everything causes cancer and everything cures cancer. So if that's the case, then I might as well just keep eating whatever I want. <laughs> um, cancer cures, yeah, that's another subject that pretty much... Um, we get into when talking about something as simple as food, you know, like for instance, uh, apricot, apricot pits. No, they do not uh, cure uh, cancer. Or likewise with dandelions or weed or anything like that. They do not cure cancer. And really, we could get on and on about that, but I'm not about to. As I said, I'm really here more to mock than anything else. Hmm. Uh, I had some uh, russet potatoes in here, and I think, oh dear, I may have accidentally scorched or even burned the bottoms of some of it, so it's giving this more of a, uh, well, I guess you could say a rustic look, but I am not worried about the flavor. Actually, so far, all I've done is thrown in some butter. Give me a second. Let's also... Spice this up just a wee bit. Where the heck did it go? And the garlic powder is somewhere in here. I also have some parsley because you gotta have parsley if I can find it. I think I just found it. And as always, thank you for waiting, folks. So into this, we will mix just a little bit of parsley flakes. Not too much, but enough. Ah, oh, yes. Dried parsley. You know, there were times when I was young when my brother would actually eat that stuff by the spoonful. <laughs> and just a little bit of garlic powder, but again, not too much. So from there, to go with our haggis, we now have some naps. And tatties, or natty, nappies and tots, however you want to call it. <laughs> and 
Anyway, as I said, this was made in a Griswold cast iron Dutch oven. I think I may have unfortunately skimped a little bit too much on the uh, water. <laughs> and as a result, as I said, the potatoes got a little bit more scorched than I would have liked. But let me make, let me do a taste test of this. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, nothing to worry about here, folks. Nothing at all. It's not burned. It just has that, mm, that just that little bit of extra flavor that you really love from uh, seared foods. So, so yeah, this is definitely going down as a plus. So this is going to be pretty good dinner tonight, that's for sure. We can definitely gorge ourselves just on these mashed potatoes. And having done that, ah, let's get back to the comments, shall we? As always, I appreciate everybody's patience. What do we have so far? We have, there is a Griswold plated chicken fryer at a local shop here. It's missing the plating on the inside. Any thoughts about removing it if I get the thing for a decent price? I am not enough of an expert to know about removing plating. Um... It may be that electrolysis might actually be able to do that. I would very much recommend going to the Wagner and Griswold Society for uh, more information about that. WAGS, look it up online, Wagner and Griswold Society. On the other hand, I've seen some instances of people who took those things and have them replated. They put new plating over it. And yeah, it looked brand new. It was really, really wonderful chrome i think it's silver amish do not get cancer uh well yes they do and <laughs> that's all i'll say um they grow their fruit their fruit veggies and meat yes they get cancer there's um that's another subject all in itself the amish are not as innocent as um as people may think <laughs> um it looks like it's been sanded. If it's still there tomorrow, I look again. Oh, I hope it isn't sanded. Yeah. What do you drink with these meals? Anything specific? Well, like the good old Scotch say, a nice shot of whiskey to go with the haggis is probably the best thing. But then again, you know, well, I know what they say about the Scots. But then again, you could say that about the French and the Germans and the Americans. You know, any excuse to drink is a good one. <laughs> uh, let me see. Going up here. Napoleon Bonaparte invented margin for his troops. Cool. I don't think it was Napoleon Bonaparte. I think it was like, in fact, Napoleon III. Remember, there are actually three Napoleons. But nonetheless, yes, he invented it for his troops. And I will repeat once again, margarine has been changed, especially over the last couple of decades, so that uh, there's very little of the original margarine left on shelves. It can be had, but... Things like country crock spread, for instance, are not margarine. And that's one of the reasons why I don't have a problem um, using it. Papa Dan. Papa Dan says, my grandsons are 14 and 8. Well, they sound like old enough that, uh, that you could actually get them. Yeah, exactly. 14-year-old can have the best <clears throat> brownies, and the 8-year-old eight will have the best brownies. And what's more, they're both old enough, you could probably even get them into the kitchen and help you cook, too. So, no e-tank for the plated pans. Okay. Hmm. Um, as I said, regrettably, I mean, here's where I demonstrate, I am not really that much of an expert on uh, cast iron. When it comes to things like, for instance, removing chrome, I know very little about it, for instance. Or, in fact, some of uh, how to remove um, aluminum dust, you know, like aluminum corrosion. I That's another thing I still have to look up. So uh, I do my best to provide advice, and I'm very grateful to everybody. Uh, but in a number of ways, I am really not that much of an expert. And you know what? I just thought, I think I will simply mix some of this haggis in with my uh, mashed potatoes. However, speaking of haggis, now I think it's time to get to the last part, which would be... Uh, the more traditional haggis, which, as I said, I made in the heart-shaped enameled cast iron pan pot. 
So yeah, the way to prepare a haggis in the, in the traditional manner is to wrap it up in tin foil, like the roller coaster folks, is to wrap it up in tin foil and then gently simmer it. You don't rapidly boil it. You don't give really ro rolling boiling water. It's more like you just do a gentle simmer for about an hour or so. After that point, you should have some freshly cooked haggis. Although, I know it's traditional, yet, as I said, you know, what is it about uh, British and Scottish cuisine, Ooh, hey, this isn't even burning me, where they just simply boil everything. I mean, that's why at least with uh, variations on it, we get to do things other than boiling. Still steaming hot, though. So this one here... Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, with this one, I actually used uh, regular, do this right. There we go. With this one, I used regular sausage casings on the haggis, and it looks like it kind of burst open. And yeah, I, I'm not even going to describe that. <laughs> However, I'm still looking forward to the taste because, as I said, that fried haggis was uh, really, really tasty. Meanwhile, the other one, <laughs> okay, yeah, hey, it's April Fool's Day as well. I mean, yes, I mean, if you want to uh, say, you know what that looks like, I don't think I will disagree with you. <laughs> and I think we'll leave, that, we'll leave it there. You can probably talk more about it in private, just not on YouTube where the uh, naughty word filter will filter it out. And this one, on the other hand, is more of the uh, original haggis that I made without putting it in sausage casings. Both of which smell like they are well done, in fact. So, yeah, I am definitely very much looking forward. Well, in fact, this, is, this has some liquid in it. I've got to carefully drain this. Yep. There we go. Nonetheless, despite the fact that it kind of burst open, this is what we are getting. As I said, I did not expect to be making this for April Fool's Day, but nonetheless, I am actually quite glad that I took the effort to do so because I don't think it turned out that badly. This is just the uh, margin, or correction, the spread <laughs> on, the, uh, on this. I don't think it turned out that bad despite the fact that it did burst. But then again, that's because I made it with sausage casings, and I probably should have poked holes in them before I actually... Um... Hmm. Okay, now i got to try a little bit of this. Mm. You know what? Mm. I think the fried is actually better. This is not bad, though. Mm. I'm not complaining about this, in fact. In fact, if I put some butter on that, that's not going to be bad at all. But nonetheless, I definitely prefer the fried stuff. Still, there we are. Okay, we got to do some of this. And give me a second again while I put the others on my plate. Thank you for waiting, as always, folks. Bit of the mashed toddies and a little bit of the nips. And so for April Fool's Day tonight. We're enjoying a Scottish dinner, something that they would normally have on Burns Night. <laughs> We've got our haggis, our naps, and our toddies. Mm. April Fool's Day, you can just switch one of those letters. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> April Fool's Day. You're talking about the toddies, aren't you? Well, even the, the other ones. Mm. Oh yeah, this oh this rutabaga is really good. I mean, really, treat please try some of that. Mmm. I am not complaining at all. As far as April Fool's Day, I think this has turned out to be one of the best 
dishes prepared. So I'm going to have to spend the next couple of days putting a real video together on this American haggis because this is not just a joke. This turned out pretty darn good. And I'm quite pleased with that. <laughs> Way cool heart-shaped pot. Who makes it? Well, uh, it's an Asian maker, and I got it from Bed Bugs and Beyond, you know, Bed Bath and Beyond. Um, they sell it every year around Valentine's Day, and it was cheap, too, relatively speaking. I paid $20 for it. That was a little more than a year ago. And it was on sale again this year at Valentine's Day for $20. So I might say, again, wait until Valentine's Day, and then you'll be able to pick it up at Bed Bath & Beyond, or as I like to say, Bed Bugs & Beyond. <laughs> or Marshall's. Grizzly cast iron makes nickel-coated pans inside and out. Yes. Um, as I mentioned last week, I received an offer from uh, one of those uh, newer manufacturers to uh, try out and unbox a nickel-plated uh, cast iron pan. And I am i haven't still haven't replied to them. I hope it's not too late. Um, Miss French Twist, English Scots and Celts are not really known for their yummy cuisine. Oh, yeah, no, I don't disagree with that. I mean, look at this. Doesn't this look yummy? Let me do that right. Yeah. Doesn't this look yummy? And yet, as anybody would say, yeah, that's definitely to traditional English cuisine. No question about that. I'm thinking I have a little bit more of these potatoes, though. Mmm. Mmm. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Mmm. Mmm. The cuisine may not look that yummy, but it mm, certainly is tasty, though, when made okay. <laughs> William Hurt, bravo. Well, thank you. Thank you again. What can I say? I like trying new things, and I found that April Fool's Day is a good excuse to really go over your way and try something especially different. I mean, as I mentioned, I've had grasshoppers. I've had ox. <clears throat> I've had, now I've had uh, haggis. Well, an American version of it, nonetheless. <laughs> And uh, I made pot brownies a few years ago. <laughs> More details about that? See the video. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't use nickel personally, but they look really nice on the wall, especially if they, if they aren't seasoned and scratched up. Peg tooth. No ketchup on your American haggis? I've never been much of a ketchup fan. I could, I suppose. It might actually flavor this up. As I mentioned, the boiled stuff does not seem to be as tasty as the uh, fried stuff. But on the boiled stuff... I might just put in some more uh, salt and pepper. I mean, I'm really, I'm more of a pepperholic than anything else. <laughs> Too bad you don't have a dog as well. <laughs> as I mentioned, the cats went crazy for this when I was preparing it. Now that it's cooked, who knows? <laughs> um, you won't say who your cast iron repair guy is. Cast iron repair guy. Oh, you mean when I, you mean that 19th century uh, pan, that is. Um, let me, uh, yeah, let me do this, I guess, right now, just so that, hope you don't mind. Maybe a little bit higher. There we go. Yeah, that uh, cast, that 19th century cast iron pan that was cracked. Um, I found a, uh, an in, a uh, welding guy who uh, did his own contract work. I'm not sure if he worked for a company as well, but he did his own contract work, and this was several years back, and he did an outstanding job of it. Um, I will have to look it up. Um, his name was Rob or something Roy. No, it wasn't Rob Roy. <laughs> I'm thinking of the Scottish, aren't I? But nonetheless, he was in Waltham, Massachusetts, and I'm not even sure if he's still around because, you know, it's been several years, but... I can look it up and uh, get some details about that because as anybody knows, uh, well, not anybody, but as a lot of people know, repairing cracked cast iron is difficult. Many welders will refuse to do it, especially because it's so hard. Fra I mean, cast iron is so fragile that uh, attempts to repair it may end up just simply breaking it. There are some who, do, who can do it and even a few who can do a really good job on it. A lot of times, of course, a welded cast iron pan will plainly look welded, which still means it's great for cooking, even if it's really um, not much of a collector's piece. <laughs> um, just slather barbecue sauce on it. Yeah, I could do that. 
or even mix it all together because, you know, um, mix it all together. Because you remember how in the old days when we were all young and it's like, we can't have our food touching each other. Whereas meanwhile, mom and grandma would always get us to eat our peas by mixing it all up with the mashed potatoes. So I can very well mix this meat, this haggis in with the, um, with the mashed potatoes. And yeah, I'm, in fact, I'm going to do that with, especially with the fried stuff. So I am really, as I said, I'm definitely looking forward to this. Hmm. I will be in the area at some point. Mayhap we can meet. I'll take you out for a chicken wing. <laughs> oh, very tempting offer. I'll say that much. Was the repair expensive? Actually, it was pretty expensive. Yes. Um, it came out to about $75. And initially it was for one pan, but he agreed to do the second pan as part of that as well. So I do feel it was worth it. I, I, because, you know, you've seen those pans in action and I have no complaints about the job he did, but really not everybody is going to pay $75 to repair a cracked cast iron pan when you could very well buy a cast iron pan, even maybe a decent vintage one for less than that. But at that time, I felt it was worth it, and I do not regret doing it. And that's really what it comes down to. Same thing with buying cast iron off of eBay or at an antique uh, store. If you find you don't feel bad about it afterwards, if you feel it was a really good investment and that you get a, some, a lot of good use out of it, then you got your money's worth. Um, have a Red Mountain number nine. I bought, sad to say, cracked. Oh, my condolences. My condolences for that. I'm sorry to hear that. So, Dutch oven, no less. Oof. Well, I get, yeah. Well, what can you say? You've got yourself a wall hanger or a uh, dis display piece. So, uh, um, I looked into it and I think nickel welding is safe. Um, so, anyway, that's pretty much uh, what it comes down to. And we are going on over an hour. We are getting close to an hour and 10 minutes. And I know a couple of these have lasted for like an hour and a half, but yeah, most of them have. But really, it's like, I mean, at this point, as I mentioned, I've only mentioned a couple of those foodie conspiracy theories because there are so many of them out there. Um, but uh, on the whole, you know, I'd say really we've kind of touched on a, a number of them. You know, we mentioned aluminum, we mentioned cadmium, and I will say again, I, until I see some really verified, there's the point, verified and duplicated evidence that enamel cast iron has anything hazardous in it, then I will indeed be uh, interested in uh, listening to the experts, experts on it. But one person doing her own uh, work, work that does not seem to be duplicated or even used as a reference by others. That is still enough to make me skeptical, and I'm not going to uh, take her word as gospel because of that. I understand she's done a lot of work about it, but she is also biased. That's the thing. And there's really no way around that, unfortunately. I mean, a biased source is, well, not really what you can call pretty much neutral. So I like to think I'm being neutral, but that's the reason why, as I said, I am skeptical and I really want more definitive and verifiable evidence before I can say that. That's, that's the big reason why I laugh at cons foodie conspiracy theorists who pretty much when, when you hear these silly scare stories about margarine, for instance, being one molecule removed from plastic, I, and I laugh on it, laugh at it, and, and point to this uh, more scientific website showing margarine is not that bad, at which point they usually do two things. One, oh, that's all just, you know, who paid for that study? And two, you need to do your research. God, I'm so sick of that phrase. I mean, I swear, the internet has put me off that stupid phrase, do your research for life. Because here's what do your research means. I don't have any real evidence to show you. So I'm going just going to say, do your research and let you do my homework for me. And which I am not going to do that.
not when it, whether we're talking about margarine or GMOs or gluten or vaccines or 9-11 or QAnon. I am not going to be satisfied with do your research. How come all these people who say do your research never, never, and I mean never, provide any examples of what they consider to be research? So uh, in all seriousness, please keep that in mind I mean, when dealing with conspiracy theories. I mean, yes, there are conspiracies that turned out to be true. Iran Contra for one, or 9-11, it was a conspiracy. I mean, I mean, really, those terrorists, they were involved in a real conspiracy that worked. Um, but probably more than 95% of all the conspiracy theories out there aren't. So all I can ask, as always, is to, is to keep an open mind. And as they like to say, question everything. Why? But question, also question the ones who say, question everything, but take my conspiracy uh, site as gospel. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, they never provide, they never provide verifi verifiable evidence. That's absolutely true. And that really, unfortunately, has to be the question I want to propose as well to Lead Safe Mama and her uh, statement that uh, ca that enameled cast iron contains dangerous amounts of cadmium because until we can see some really verifiable and reproducible evidence of that, I really cannot accept that. All right. Anyway, okay. Yeah, he does good work. I have a number nine slant in Victor, and they have small hairline cracks on the wall. Well, Sorry about that. You can still do a number of this with it. Just don't deep fry. Is that sweet enamel and aluminum Dutch oven from the 1930s, 1940s? Actually, it, I found out it's more like from the 1960s all the way to the 1980s. And the way to tell is because of the lid. Namely, this uh, design on the lid here was not done in those days in the 30s and 40s. I mean, it does seem to have something of a retro design to it. But apparently, the lids of the older ones did not look like that. They looked more like regular Dutch ovens, except that they were aluminum. At least that's my understanding. So, <laughs> Hi, right, Papa Dan. Have a good have a good day tomorrow. Yeah, they read they read it on the internet. America is back at the carnival. Look out for the clip joints. <laughs> um, and I use my enamel lodge Dutch oven a few times a week and love it. And and all I can say right now is just keep on using it. So I will have to do some more research into the history of this enamel Dutch oven. As I said, currently I am of the opinion it's 1960s to 1980s. And there's still nothing wrong with that. In fact, I found a second one of those for like $10 a couple of months ago and is currently sitting with the uh, set of uh, kitchenware that I will be uh, giving Jamie uh, once she... Um, how to say this the right way? Because I am not meaning this in a bad way. If and when we reach the point where we go our separate ways, we're roommates right now. We're just friends. We're just roommates. But eventually... If, say, for instance, Jamie gets her own place and takes her son with her, I will do my best to um, furnish her kitchen and, and get some really nice quality stuff, including a Wagner enamel Dutch oven. Hmm. Yes, you do. So, hmm. all right. You're getting spread on your shirt. I am? Yeah, I probably am. So <laughs> I better watch myself. However, at this point, I think it's really time to eat because I'm just rambling on at this point. And we are getting now about an hour and 15 minutes anyway. So nonetheless, really what it all comes down to is, as I said, tomorrow's April Fool's Day and everybody have fun. That's why I, that's why I wanted to do this silly topic for tonight, which turned out to be not so silly because I am very happy with how this American haggis turned out. Because there we go. Tonight, I have introduced everybody to my recipe for American haggis. I'll have this on my website. And I'm, and really, within the next couple of days, I really want to finish a video I have on more details of preparing for it. Because this turned out pretty darn good. I am looking forward to eating it. <laughs> and, and you too, folks. Above all else, of course, you know, enjoy yourself. Have 
bun cooking in your cast iron or your aluminum or, or anything else. But yeah, especially the cast iron. <laughs> so thank you once again, everybody, for showing up. And um, how did your how did your beef loaf? <laughs> um, it loafs very nicely. And 99, William Hurt and Bookworm 73 and Peg Tooth. Will you include Stumpy in the kitchen kit? Um, not unless I managed to find a genuine uh, BSR Red Mountain number 14. Otherwise, skill, uh, Stumpy is going to stay with me probably for the rest of my life. And yeah, and Jamie says she may not ever have a reason for having a skill at that big. Yes. So, <laughs> all right. Nonetheless. Oh, yeah. There's the sentimental value. I've made a lot of good things in, in Stumpy. Okay. And with that, I think we're, we're going to cut this out. So thank you very much for watching, everybody. And once again, all I can say, oh, next week we will get, be getting on to a more regular cast iron topic. But still, nonetheless, once again, I will say to everybody, thank you for showing up. And see you all next Wednesday. Bye. Good night. Okay. There we go. I